in short, it's got the subtle title of How to Win at Law School. Um, again, the website's Larry Lala. And, and this is a webinar just for you um, students of formerly LSAT blog, now LSAT Unplugged, to be super clear. Uh, so I've had an online business and in-person tutoring business for nine years. I'm a practicing lawyer. I went to NYU Law some time ago, and I graduated with, um, with high honors, magna cum laude, order of the coif is kind of the legal honor society, and I was on law review and all these other things. Um, and at some point, I decided... Um, uh, in law school, I was actually a tutor to other students, even um, as of my second year, and I was a teaching assistant. I really loved trying to help other people understand the law because I feel that professors, even those that I really liked a lot, did a lot to try to mystify the law. So this is something, this is the kind of question that I get relatively frequently. Um, uh, if people want to know what it is that they um, should be doing to get an edge over other law students. Um, and I think we have to get to super foundational basic questions. Uh, what is law school like? I think you have to know what it is before you can have a strategy at winning at it. And honestly, this, this is, <laughs> um, you have to understand the kind of pressures that you're under. Law school is this kind of idea at this point, but it will have a very specific impact on you. You will face certain pressures, and those pressures will push you into what I think is the wrong approach to studying for law school. And these are your kind of pressures. You've got piles of books, other students, and the professors themselves. And this is what I mean by that. Um, the very start of law school, even, even before you start, you get uh, these emails from the administration. And you have a reading assignment before the first day of school. Um, and you can take a look at NYU laws or, or kind of check your own. Um, but you'll get syllabi. You have to go buy books before your first day, and you'll have reading assignments. And, you know, it may, uh, this is uh, UCLA is from a couple of years ago. Uh, they give you a whole bunch of other things to look at and ways to prepare orientation and then reading assignments. Um, but before that, you'll get these emails that tell you to take it easy over the summer, uh, not to worry too much, um, not to prepare during the summer before, uh, as if there's some way that you could somehow prepare. Uh, nevertheless, you'll see this, this is a second semester assignment, but You'll get, for our first class, please read some casebook and this article. Come prepared to discuss the material. I look forward to the meeting. This is an actual professor at NYU. Um, bunch of syllabi. I'll distribute these soon. So you buy this giant stack of books. You have an assignment your first day. These are real piles of books, by the way. Just, just letting you know, real piles of 1L books. So let's take her example. You, you've got to read 42 pages before the first class. Um, it's not atypical, but let's say it's 25. You have three to four classes, uh, subjects that you have to study. Each of those classes meets two to three times weekly. So let's say you've got 25 pages times four times 2.5. Four classes, two and a half classes on average per week, 250 pages a week. And this is slow, careful reading. Now, maybe you've read more if you were an arts um, and letters kind of major. Uh, this is slow, painful, kind of uh, um, 
careful reading. Uh, the Scott Turow, the author of 1L, and um, he's a partner at a Chicago law firm, and he writes uh, books on the side, uh, Presumed Innocent, um, things like that. And he once described reading cases as mixing cement with your eyelashes. Uh, and you think, oh, this is this is this is easy. Um, all I have to do is do the reading. Um, and you think to yourself, that's not a problem. I read more than that. But if that's all you're given and that's all you know, the way you prepare is to read and to, to reread and reread the assignments. You have that same, um, say, 25-page assignment for a class. You read and you reread and Maybe you can do other things. Maybe you can make case briefs. Uh, that's something that I discussed in another video. Um, and I can, that, that's basically kind of summarizing the cases that you're reading. And you'll spend all week just reading cases if you take this approach. So what's behind that in a way is, before I go on to the other students, this model of law school that you think it's kind of uh, like college. If you do the reading, you'll do well. We'll see. Second big kind of pressure in law school is other students. Um, you've seen law school classrooms. You, depending on the size of the law school, you uh, have 100 people or 50 people per section. You either sit in big crescents or kind of big squares. They're kind of rising desks, and you have the professor sitting here. These are the single worst drawings of professors ever. That's a head and a bow tie and a stick, no legs and uh, no arms, just this weird stick torso. Um, and think about the students at your law school. They are literally your peers. They're almost just like you in the sense that they're in the same GPA range, the same LSAT range, and there's every reason to believe that they're no better or worse than you are. Part of that is by the selection process of law school, um, that they're all within certain ranges. Certain law schools are kind of within similar ranges, Chicago, NYU, Columbia, and maybe Yale's its own bracket. Harvard and Stanford are pretty similar. Maybe they're the same. But um, by the way people are selected to be in law schools, and the law schools, they, people generally try to go to the best law school that they can, depending on scholarship money and, and whatnot. They're just like you. So what does that mean? Um, law students are a bunch of Hermione's, but that's not really you. You're going to have to just live with some of these constant and endless flow of pop culture. This is not really you in law school. This is, this is you after seven eight movies, if you count the last one, split into two. Um, after some experience, but maybe this is more you when you start law school, uh, or this is you, um, Hermione, or maybe this is you, Velma, or Brainy Smurf. That's what you all maybe seem like on the outside, or that's how you see other students and maybe how they see you, but there's a psychology to how you feel when you get there. There's this kind of uh, well-known psychological phenomenon of um, imposter syndrome. And it's not uncommon amongst high-achieving people to feel like they don't deserve it or uh, that secretly they're worried that other people um, are smarter and that their accomplishments don't mean much. So maybe you feel like Neville Longbottom, apologies if you don't uh, like Harry Potter, but he's the best example I could think of. And this is kind of, I don't know why Hermione smiling in the background. But this is kind of how you feel. You feel like Neville in a giant uh, class full of Hermione's. Um, but this is what you really are. You really are Hermione. You really are as good as all of the other law students. But all of you will have this imposter syndrome where you all think you're actually Neville. So the class is full of people who all on the outside seem quite smart and quite competent, but internally are insecure about what's happening and whether they'll do well in law school. 
this is life in class. If I have any advice about that, it's to be friendly. Um, there's no reason to be, in my mind, outwardly competitive with other law students. Um, but the fact is, so that's one thing. Um, this is the psychological fact of life. This means that you should treat other people as you would well as you'd want to be treated. Um, exams is another story. There's nothing, there's, um, you, you're not going to compete in any uh, weirdo overt way. You should um, uh, still be nice to people. But exams will be a kind of uh, um, whatever this is, <laughs> um, whatever analogy you want to use, um, there's a forced curve and there are only a couple of survivors in each class. There are only people, uh, a handful of people because of the forced curve who will get good grades in law school. So I don't know, there's Battle Royale or Thunderdome or for whatever reason, I can remember Jennifer Lawrence's character's name, but um, the Hunger Games. So the bad news is that the only thing that matters um, um, is exam performance, and it's based on skills that only you can develop. Um, that's also kind of the good news, that exam performance is based on skills that you can develop. Uh, you can develop the capacity to do well on law school exams before you arrive at law school. The last stressor is professors. So this is John Houseman, who won an Academy Award to be uh, this uh, fictional but based somewhat on fact Harvard Law professor, uh, Charles Kingsfield in the Paper Chase, which is now... Uh, Randomly, this is another John Houseman I found when I was trying to Google an image for him. Um, I love the awesome matching tattoos. Paper Chase is now, maybe I have the year wrong, now it's 46 years old. It's worth watching. It totally exaggerates and over-dramatizes law school. Your law school class will not be anywhere near this dramatic. But there's a certain emotional truth at its core about how students react to law school and how intimidated they feel by their professors. Uh, to fall back on Harry Potter again, the more modern analog is Snape. Everyone knows what Snape is like. He is imperious and punishing. So you'll get this as a line straight from the movie, recite the facts of Hawkins versus McGee. It's a famous contracts case. You feel like he's shooting lasers at you. This is older Neville Longbottom. And then you have this component. If you watch um, the paper chase, you'll notice that the thing that's accurate about it is that you sit in the class in rows with 100 other law students, and you can be cold called uh, to discuss the reading that you were asked to do. And it's part of what's called the Socratic method, where the professor will just grill you with questions. But mostly it feels like an opportunity to feel stupid in front of all the other people that you think are smart. So, um, and I'll frankly tell you that I was not great in class. At least I didn't think I was. I thought I was kind of a mumbling idiot the few times I was called on. Um, so you kind of end up mumbling like this, or this is what, this is your internal monologue, at least, even if you're providing a lucid answer. But no matter what, you'll kind of still, <laughs> the professor may still um, look at you. You're filled with a sea of Hermione's. They're happy to kind of fill the answer and everything that you missed. Um, what the shit was that long bottom? And so he just kills um, for Neville. This is uh, really important. So you have the combination of readings, um, 
an intimidating professor and concerned that you're going to look like a fool in front of your peers. This kind of humiliation is probably our greatest fear, at least according to a lot of poll numbers, 74% of adults. Who knows where this statistic came from because it's not pulled from statistic brain, it's pulled from somewhere else, but most people are reasonably afraid of public speaking. And supposedly I've read people fear public speaking more than more than death, which is crazy because dying um, is a lot more humiliating. Um, but remember, this isn't just public speaking on your terms. It's a public interrogation almost to expose uh, how much you do and you're, you don't know. The Socratic method is the main method used to teach in class. Uh, but there's no point at which you arrive at a correct answer necessarily, according to the kind of strict version of the Socratic method. The, the lack of a right answer and the need to fill class time means the professor is going to keep grilling you even if you provide every possible wonderful answer that no one's ever uh, done better than you before. So this will just keep going on and on and on. So if you put it together, um, you've got a ton of reading, you've got a lot of smart peers, and you've got an intimidating professor. This is peer pressure to overwork, um, especially in the wrong ways if you don't know what the end game is for law school. So this is the response. People go back and they read and they reread and they want to know every single detail of every single case that they read about in class so that they can't be caught off guard. So they'll have all the right answers at their fingertips when they're called on by a professor. So you'll pile on the work. This is uh, Wonder Woman's mom. Now I'm, I'm pop culture obsessed and I'm beginning to forget Robin Wright's character's name here, but she's the queen. No, she's the aunt who trains Calliope. Um, but people respond, how did you do well before you worked really hard? So if you just keep working, maybe you can outwork other people who are equally smart and hardworking. That's the idea. But the result is you end up Antiope, not Calliope. Uh, you end up as boxer from Animal Farm, I will work harder. And boxer kept working until he was turned to glue. Probably not totally non-toxic kids glue, but whatever. So that is the background. That's what you're kind of going up against heading into law school. Those are the pressures that you will face. What are you supposed to do? I think the, the most normal coping strategies, we start, we know what we know we don't know. And maybe if we're lucky, we're vaguely aware of what we don't know. So, but the key is that we end up falling back on old habits. So we do what we did in college. We were almost by definition good at college. Otherwise, you wouldn't be heading to a law school and especially if you're headed to a fancy law school, you were very good at college. The question is, and obviously this is a trick question, is this the right way to think about law school? Is college a good model for how you should study in law school? Here's college and here's law school. And I think most people kind of tend to think of law school as just college, but kind of more intense. You give up the Frank the Tank days. Um, and you end up, I think this is Susan Estridge. I'm not sure. It's some famous person who, um, whose hair stuck up a lot in law school. These are the assumptions that you take from college. You read everything, you take notes on everything, and then you kind of barf it back to the professor, and that should do it. That should actually give you the good results that you have had in the past. But this is, this is what law school is like, given the background um, that I've given you. Um, and now I'm going to fill in a little more, um, kind of beyond the pressures of just pile of books, scary peers, scary professor. Um, you're reading the case books, but they're honestly terribly written. 
um, and you're trying your best to understand the cases so that you don't get called out in class terribly. <laughs> badly written means badly written. Um, uh, now, the late Justice Antonin, Antonin Scalia was known for his good writing and was once asked, whatever you think of him, was once asked like, oh, Justice Scalia, you're so well known for your great legal writing, to which he responded something along the lines of, well, you know, that's not much of a compliment. Uh, legal writing is to writing as military music is to music. Um, the whole field is kind of plagued by really terrible writing. It's not a good example of clarity. It's a great example of people trying to sound smart. And in many cases, if they have um, bad cases or uh, hard arguments against them, uh, intentional obfuscation. So again, coming back to college, you spend most of your time reading listening to Professor Grill students on cases, you're not likely to be on call that many times, but you're afraid of it. And the rest of the time, you're watching other people get it from the professor. Um, at best, you get someone who is getting kind of the answers that the professor wants to elicit, but you may also get a totally confused student who's not getting there, and then the entire class misses the point. So there's, again, strong pressure to prepare so you don't look stupid in class. This is kind of the key. This is one of the core disconnects in law school. And if you take nothing else away from this webinar, it is please keep this in mind as you approach law school. You spend most of your time on this crap. But your grades will be driven by the rest of it. You will be graded on a final exam. Mostly, most classes are 100% final. There's not uh, midterms at most law schools. There's just the final exam. The exam does not test the kinds of things that were tested in college. It doesn't test your knowledge of the reading or the lecture notes, or your ability to regurgitate that, or even your ability to cleverly synthesize a lot of the material that you were required to digest. A law school exam is the resolution of a completely new legal problem that you have not encountered before. It may be in part similar to cases that you've read about before. In this way, it's almost like math. You can understand the principles that you've been learning, but the final exam isn't uh, a compilate, isn't asking you like, what are those principles? How do you, I can't remember anything from like high school calculus, integrate a different, something like this. Um, it's not that you get a new problem and whether you understand the principle is not based on whether you can say what it is, it's whether you can apply it and solve the problem. To be even more specific, the final exam is a fact pattern. It's a set of facts that you've never seen. Can you develop, actually create from scratch and resolve legal claims and defenses? Okay. You develop them, you come up with counter arguments, and you resolve them as if you were a judge. You have all of these pretty sophisticated tasks. And then on top of that, can you do that better than 90 to 95% of your class? That's basically what it takes to get an A. But if you notice, none of this is what you spent the entire semester doing, what was driving you crazy during. 13 to 14 weeks of your semester. Um, you weren't asked to solve new legal problems. You were reading previously decided cases and grilled about whether or not they were decided correctly. Did you remember all the facts um, from a law professor? This is a totally different set of skills than this. And also, Realize you never get feedback 
on the exam that you took unless you ask, and you never get a professor's feedback before the exam, you don't have a midterm, you don't know how you're doing, you have no way to gauge if you're in good shape or horrible shape before an exam. The school doesn't really give you, uh, there's no required way of knowing whether uh, uh, you know what you're doing in terms of this set of skills that you actually need to have on the exam before, um, until it's too late. So I often, over the years, I've gotten a lot of second semester students who came to me and said, uh, this, is, this is an actual quote, um, I understood the material so well that my grade just doesn't reflect that. And law school is the first time that a lot of students get crappy grades ever. So let me try and summarize what I think are the major differences between college and law school. Uh, I think this applies somewhat less if you did like engineering or math, and a lot more if you were in the humanities or social sciences. College is about passive learning to me, uh, for the most part. This is a generality, but for the most part, it's kind of passive learning. It's the acquisition of knowledge. It's kind of stuffing things into your head. Law school involves a kind of active learning. Uh, that isn't just knowledge, but it's the application of knowledge. So um, that's expressed by the next bullet. College is about acquiring knowledge. Law school is about acquiring knowledge and a set of skills. Um, more broadly, college, you have time to adjust. I don't know about you. I was like a public school kid from a totally random state. Um, yeah, Reno, thanks, mom and dad. Uh, for raising me there. Um, and so it took me a while to adjust to, to college. It took me a semester. Um, I, um, but you have time to kind of recover. You, the, your, your future is still fine if you recover, if you have a bad first semester uh, or even first year. Uh, you have three more years to improve your grades and still do well. Law school, um, your first year makes your destiny. A lot of that is because most of the spoils of law school, the uh, plum jobs and clerkships are available right, you interview for them right after your first year. Lord knows why you end up spending two more years in law school, um, but the job that you will eventually get out of law school, you interview for that right after your first year, maybe the summer uh, or the fall, but it's only based on your first year grades that you do that and clerkships are like this as well. College in a lot of places, there's grade inflation, there's grade inflation where I was. Law school, even if there, you know, everything is, is on, a, on a B curve and no one gets C's, there's still a hard curve and employers know the difference between the people who get the top grades, even if it's like a pass, high pass kind of school, and people who don't. There's a hard curve. Whatever the medium is, most people are there. Very few people are getting the top grades. College is about, I think, is a little more transparent. I mean, there are a lot of terrible teachers, but generally if you do the work uh, and you do, you do it, you can do well. Uh, law school is honestly a lot about professors hiding the ball. The core disconnect that I mentioned before, the one thing I hope you take away from this webinar, um, that the time, the things that you do during most of the semester do not, in a direct way, help you um, with the final exam. In college, there tend to be resources, or I remember them being advertised in college. If you're not doing well, there were kind of clinics you could go to or tutors you could get. Law school, there isn't so much that. It's a professional school. Um, I was an officially paid tutor by NYU Law to teach contracts and some other things, but for the most part, I, they don't advertise those very much. Um, I don't remember uh, my first year even knowing that such resources were available. Okay, so here's what I think um, it takes to do well in law school. Um, 
think of this like chess, which I don't play, but my younger kid does. Um, she is young enough that she calls it chess, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, my understanding um, is that well-taught chess starts with the end game and works backwards. You start with like king versus king and pawn. Uh, and you see how you can kind of finish the game off with that. The chess comes down to the end game. You need to know what you're working toward. And I think you have to do the same thing with law school. What is the right question to be asking here? And I think it's, what skills do I need to do well on the final exam? You have to detangle that from the mess of things that you're asked to do at the beginning of the semester. Um, to do all this reading, I'm, and you'll see in a moment, I'm not telling you to blow all of that off, but um, to read and to reread and to read a million times uh, and to be really good in class is, if you really ask yourself this question, what skills do I need to do well in the final exam? If you look at it through that light, um, knowing every fact in every case that you read so that you're super prepared for class and you're not humiliated in class is not the right way to approach law school. Ask yourself when you get to law school, is what my professor, um, is what my professor tells me to do going to help me uh, develop these skills? So um, I've said a little bit about what a final exam is like. Um, what do you need to do well on a final exam? Honestly, um, I used to be in private practice. I'm not anymore. I do something else uh, still uh, law-related, requiring a legal degree. Um, I used to work at a big firm in New York and then a smaller one. And at the smaller one, I had actual individual clients who would walk in with a problem. And the client would come in and say, this is my story. And they would tell me a story, um, you know, a family fighting with other family members over money or someone fighting with a bank. And they would tell me a story. It's like one of these kind of old detective movies from the 40s. Um, but there's a reason they're telling me the story. They want me to use my legal skills to give them to kind of do an assessment. You don't just jump to court. Your first role, probably your primary role as an attorney that's not seen on television is not the person kind of thundering in court like Tom Cruise or Perry Mason or I don't even know who does these things. And I think legal shows kind of played out. Um, there is a role for the courtroom lawyer, but even before being a courtroom lawyer, even a good courtroom lawyer is a good counselor. And a good counselor takes in a story, performs an objective legal analysis, and provides advice to the client. Should you sue, would you win? What do you need to do to be able to kind of do that kind of work? You need a foundation of legal knowledge. That's different from reading cases. Memorizing case facts, um, that's not the same thing as legal knowledge. There are principles contained in those cases uh, that for at least 100 years since Christopher Langdell became the dean of Harvard Law School in the late 1890s, we've had the same um, approach to legal education for over 130 years. And it's to mine cases for underlying principles to understand them. Now, I used to crap on Christopher Langdell for a while. I think he's actually much more interesting. He innovated a lot in 1890 uh, before... Uh, I don't know, electricity in most places, uh, cars. Um, he's an interesting character. That's a story for another day. The thing that you use is not the case itself. It's a principle that can be extracted from the case called the black letter law. And usually it's a set of elements or factors 
that uh, are required to fulfill a legal claim. So battery, uh, punching someone, that's an intentional tort. Normally, a battery is defined as an offensive, non-consensual touching uh, without consent. And let's go back. An intentional, offensive touching without consent. So spitting on someone is a battery, hitting them with a cane, um, hitting their cane. Uh, it's the elements let you know if there's a claim there. You have to apply facts to those elements. So you start with legal knowledge. You need that as your foundation, but it's a necessary it's a necessary, not sufficient condition to be able to perform a legal analysis. You, you also actually need practice answering this kind of a legal question as to whether or not there uh, is a, 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 a viable legal claim in terms of analyzing issues and then uh, the foundational issue. The reason that these exams are called issue spotting exams is you have to be able to spot the issue then use the law to analyze it. All of this, so you need legal knowledge, you need practice performing a legal analysis, and then you need to not only have do this kind of analysis, but make this analysis palatable to your judge. You, you kind of adjust your arguments for the judge that you have. Um, and the judge should, in a straightforward way, apply the black letter law. But we're all human. We have different approaches to things. And there are some ways, given certain personalities, that you can sell an argument to your judge. Your first judge is your first year professor on a super subjective exam, which kind of like court, uh, being in, in trial court, like um, the judge, you just have the one judge, the professor decides. So these are the three pillars. These are the three very broadly things that you need to focus on in law school. You master the law, you master issue spotting, and you need to master your professor. I'm going to go through each of these in turn. Mastering the law, what does that mean and how do you do it? Mastering the law is memorizing the elements and factors of the relevant claims for that area of law, criminal law, contract law, property law. I gave you an example in terms of battery. It's, you know, you'll have a case like the famous eggshell uh, skull uh, uh, case in torts um, uh, um, or the hairy hand case. All of those are usually there to illustrate um, or illuminate one of the elements um, of a claim or to set out the elements of a claim. Um, don't, th this is kind of distinguishing the wheat from the chaff. Uh, they are not, they are, they can be found in the cases, but don't mistake legal knowledge for the cases themselves. They, the cases are important, but not on their own. There, there, there's a way to use the cases, and I'll kind of get into this a bit more. So how in the world do you kind of master the law without kind of reading and rereading and rereading the cases, as the professors will tell you uh, to do? And uh, with the implication being, you will learn the law this way. Um, your strategy, the thing that you do that other students won't do is to pre-study, or what I call pre-study or side-study the law. You use commercial outlines. These are um, Emmanuel's or Gilbert's, and all they do is set out for the subject matter that you're studying all of the elements and factors of uh, the claims relevant to an area of law, all the kind of claims for torts, intentional torts, negligence, strict liability. In contracts law, you'll, you'll get all of the, the elements and factors involving uh, uh, contract formation, contract bre breach, and damages, things like that. And they get more uh, uh, detailed. Um, there are a couple reasons to do this. And, 
first, just because they are the, the, the foundation with which you will be able to perform a legal analysis, but you will surprisingly understand class and even your reading better if you master um, the law first, if you study and ideally uh, get in your head. I wouldn't go so far as to say memorize. Um, it, it wouldn't hurt. But if you study these outlines, you're in good shape. Um, here's the analogy I always use for mastering the law. Um, law school, uh, the analogy is if law school were a medical school, there are two ways you could study the circulatory system. You could just look at a map of the circulatory system. You can see the heart um, and the lungs and all the uh, arteries and veins and capillaries. You go, okay, that's, that's I see, that's a um, model of the circulatory system. Law school just throws you <laughs> into the deep end by making you um, cut open a person with heart disease and to perform surgery on them just to understand a map of the circulatory system. To spend time going through cases, a lot of the times cases are picked not because they, a lot of them are foundational, but a lot of them are selected because they present difficult problems in the law, which means that they're not super clear, which means that they're not a good base to understand kind of what normal life looks like or what a claim, just the bare bones of a claim actually is. Master issue spotting. Okay, so let's assume that you've mastered the law or enough of it uh, to be able to identify and assess claims. Mastering issue spotting involves uh, what's called IRAC. Um, this is the mechanics of issue analysis and spotting. Now, you will hear of IRAC as if it's <laughs> an actual helpful thing. I think it's a very general framework for doing legal analysis. What does IRAC mean? It's issue, rule, application, conclusion. It's usually the structure of a, any legal answer, but I see it as less uh, of a guideline on how to answer as just a description of what happens to be in a cogent legal analysis. There's the identification of the issue, the identification of the applicable rule, which is to say something that sets out the elements of the claim that's relevant to what you're trying to think about, application and conclusion. Um, so you need to learn how to do that in order to do an analysis and then to do issue spotting. How do you get good at that? And my shorthand for this is to take a practice exam a day. Um, I already said if there's one thing you take away from this free webinar, it's that the things that you're asked to do are not the things that you will be tested on. If I could, if you can only take two things away from this webinar, it's that and Tapiad. If you work on taking a practice exam or a hypo every day, it's easy to say every day. If you do it on some regular basis, even starting at the beginning of the semester, you will have uh, a gigantic legal analysis muscle in your head and will be unstoppable. But uh, not everyone believes me on this. Um, I have students who did well who can uh, be the, the, the pudding that is the proof of that. Um, so you learn the IRAC, you learn IRAC. Um, it's not, let me, let me take a step back. Why do you need to do this? Mile in chief, mile in chief. Uh, we're going to talk about biology for two minutes. Legal analysis is a skill, and I would argue it's even a physical one. Most people who go through law school eventually learn how to perform a decent legal analysis. The question for purposes of you excelling in law school is, can you 
get up that learning curve faster than 90 to 95% of other students. How do you do that? You need to practice early and you have to practice the correct way, but you have to practice. Um, the myelin sheath is what's built up in your, in your brain. It's actual insulation um, that as you practice any skill, a mental one or a physical one, um, at this late age, I've taken up surfing. I'm getting better. A lot of that is the myelin sheath um, kind of insulating the signals that are sent from neurons to my body to surf crappily as I do. Um, this is just as much a physical skill to learn how to read quickly to assess claims. Um, you need to practice daily to get better at this faster than everyone else. Um, the practice does need to be deliberate. Um, you need to get feedback on the exams, on the practice exams you're taking. Where do you go to do that? If you have a very nice professor, they might be willing to look at practice exams and give you comments. Um, I've had students at least ask their professors to do this. Usually it, uh, they're, they don't, they're not that helpful. Um, you, a lot of classes have teaching assistants that look at practice exams. I was a teaching assistant to my criminal law professor. I think I got the best grade in his class. Uh, and I, um, this is, this was a lot of my job. I sat in class and looked like I knew what I was talking about, but most of what I did was actually mark up practice exams, which is how I started on this, um, second kind of career. Um, you can also try to trade exams with peers. Um, you can see that I may have some questions. I'm going to take them at the end, but I'll take them in the order that they're listed in the chat if you have questions. The third pillar is mastering your professor. Um, and a lot of this, is, you know, I'm kind of suggesting that you ignore your professor's advice on how to study, um, but do study what they do in class. Don't necessarily do what they tell you to do, but kind of at a meta level, study what it is that they seem to like in class. Um, ignore their study advice. Look up, if you want, on my website, LarryLawLaw.com, I have an article called Rainbow Vomit. Um, it's also appeared on Above the Law, and it's... Um, uh, that they basically um anyway uh the full article is on above uh, is on larry lala um i don't want to say more on this um but in short uh, i don't think the short version of the rainbow vomit article is law professors do not know what is effective in terms of getting a's they know um remember that exams are graded blind, if the professor has no idea what your study methods are, uh, they just, they assume that the students who got A's were the ones who did what they said to do, but they have no way of knowing. I have a lot of law professor friends. Some of them, I let them know that this is my side business. I have uh, a law professor friend at Harvard Law School. Um, he's generally validated my advice, but he has... He, feels a certainty that he knows um, what it is that, that causes students to do well, but he doesn't have data. He, no professor, professors hate, let, let's take a step back. Uh, one of the things that makes me mad is come December or May, I very often am on Facebook and I'll see my law professor friends who have very nice professional careers. They have a lot of freedom. They get to kind of study things that they want to. So nothing makes me matter when I see them complain or talk shit about their students. Uh, but one of the things that they will universally say is, oh, life is so hard. I have to grade these exams. They barely want to grade the exams. Guaranteed, very few professors actually know what works and what doesn't know, uh, uh, what doesn't work. They are not an expert in what it takes to do well on the study skills that it takes to do well in their class. They are experts at what they like on exams since they're the ones who are applying their preferences to exams. So 
in class, you want to focus on the language that they use, certain preferred, uh, preferences that they have for vocabulary. My criminal law professor uh, liked to use the phrase Leningrad drunk, which to him was the shorthand for uh, the intoxication defense that you were, you know, just being buzzed is not enough to negate specific intent um, on crimes such as murder or arson or burglary. You have to know that you're doing this. Uh, but it's not enough to have had a couple of beers. What is the level of intoxication necessary? It's kind of being at the level of blackout drunk where you don't know what you're doing. In class, he told this long random story about how in the 60s he'd studied at Oxford before going to Harvard Law School and had visited what was then called Leningrad and drinking an entire bottle of vodka and walking on the Nevsky Prospect on his hands and knees. Um, he called that Leningrad drunk. The reason I say this is it wasn't just, you know, everyone always laughed at this story, but you were expected. It, it wasn't um, just something that got you extra points. You were expected to say that a, a character in, a, in one of his fact patterns was Leningrad drunk or analyze it in, as to whether or not someone was at that level of intoxication. If you use the phrase level of intoxication sufficient to negate, negate specific intent, he would not have thought that you had paid attention in class. You had to use the word Leningrad drunk. Uh, so a lot of mastering your professor so that you can maximize the chance that your good legal analysis appeals to your law professor is to focus on language, on preferences, and on hypos that they raise in class. Now, when I said before that law school exams are a set of facts that you have never seen before, that was kind of a partial truth. Sometimes professors will take a, a case that you are studying and say, what if we change this fact? Or what if we change this fact by this degree? Um, what's the right result then? Is the person still liable? Is the person still guilty? Um, your ears need to be, you need to be super alert for these kinds of things in class. I will hop back to uh, mastering the law. Uh, the reason that reading, um, mastering the law is helpful in class, and not just understanding cases, but if you already know what a case is about, you are freed up uh, to really listen, actively listen carefully for these other things, including hypos, including a professor's language preferences. Um, you never want to walk into class and not already understand what the point of a case is. So um, all of these three factors kind of interact. Uh, Mastering of the law is the foundation for being able to form a legal analysis. It also, mastering the law, helps with mastering your professor. It clears up RAM in your mind so that you can focus on these other more subtle things that honestly are the difference between a B plus and an A minus or an A minus and an A. The easy schematic is that you need, I, you know, this isn't in completely accurate or to scale, but this is, in my mind, how the three pillars work. You need to start with mastering the law. Um, that your ability to issue spot is built on your ability to master the law. And unless you're already issue spotting a good level, mastering professor isn't really of much use. But if you're at this level, you can then really talk to your professor um, and make the professor really feel heard um, and get the top grade in your class. So this is kind of, you know, totally informal. If you're at this, if you've really reached this level, you're in A and A minus territory. Even if you don't do this, if you're a competent, if you're really practiced at issue spotting, um, let's say you never go to class, which you should, you should totally go to class, um, not just because you're told to, but was, so you can pick up these other subtleties. But even if you didn't do this, being an excellent, competent issue spotter will get you in the range to get decent grades, A minus, B plus. That, that may be enough to do what you want. Um, it's not totally dominating law school, but 
you will be at the higher end of your class. If you just master the law without having done this, you're going to be in the middle of the pack or less, unless you're lucky. And you may be, but chances are not. Just as important uh, as what to do is what not to do. Um, given these things, th these three pillars of so-called wisdom, mastering the law, mastering issue spotting, mastering a professor, as a general rule, you don't want to do anything that doesn't directly help you with one of these buckets. Okay. So what do I mean? Don't brief cases. Don't reread cases. Uh, and this is also to say don't read cases much in advance. My advice is that you just read a case the night before. Preferably, you pre-studied the law already. If you need to, what I call, side-study the law, um, a lot of you are already super early, so I super recommend that you pre-study the law. But if you happen to ignore my advice, um, or you're watching this as a recording and this is September, it's not too late to just have the outline that you buy next to your case book and to read what the outline says about a case. Um, outlines such as Emmanuel's and Gilbert's are keyed to case books, the major case books that you're likely to use. So you can always, almost always, find uh, the black letter law for the cases that you're reading. Um, don't read long treatises. Um, these are long explanations of the law, which you think that if having the outline knowing the black letter law is good, then reading a super long treatment of that is even better. Uh, I, you, you will get bogged down. It's, it's, it's almost too much knowledge. Uh, I would say avoid extracurriculars first year. They don't help you with your resume. They really don't. I mean, your resume is kind of made before you get to law school. Being in a bunch of clubs will not make the difference between you getting a job and not getting a job at least first year. Second year, you should be on some kind of law journal, especially law review, if you can get on it. But first year, don't do extracurriculars just for the sake of um, your resume. If there's something that you love, like trial advocacy or something, do that because you love it and you can't live without it. Otherwise, if you can possibly resist it, don't. You need the extra time to study the right way. Uh, I do recommend study groups. I don't recommend long BS sessions with study groups that can happen. You, people will use their study groups as emotional support systems. They can be, but if that takes the form of spending hours every day discussing what you do and you don't understand, wrong. Uh, don't over outline. Uh, that's something we can, I can discuss in more detail later with any of you. Okay, issue analysis. What is issue analysis? It's, it's what you do after you spot the issue. Now, pure form issue spotting is maybe the last skill that it's the hardest to develop, and I'll come back to that. What is an issue? So let, let's, let's back up. Let's put this in context. Why am I talking about this? Um, you need to understand what issue analysis is because it is the skill to do well on a final exam. But there's a nuance that you need to understand about it. Um, and I'm going to walk through, once you understand the nuance, if you get this nuance, you've got something that 90% of law students, most law students don't get when they arrive at law school. Okay. What's an issue? This is kind of a deeper question. So this, to me, an issue is an important fact or set of facts in a story, in a fact pattern, that begs further legal analysis. It's a fact that suggests, it doesn't say with certainty, it's a fact that at least hints that one party could consider bringing a legal claim against another. The fact does not need to suggest a completely successful claim. In fact, the the opposite is true for you to get good grades. The opposite is true for you to get good grades. Because good issue spotters look for iffy, borderline, barely viable claims. That is where the gold is in a final exam. Everyone will get the easy issues. Only the best issue spotters get the marginal issues. Okay. 
Um, so what's issue analysis? Generally, once you've identified an issue, issue analysis is the process that helps you decide if, an, if a legal claim would succeed or not. So that's the high level. Specifically, you take the black letter law, you look for facts or interpretation of facts to fit to each element or factor of the black letter law and you conclude. So IRAC is the standard formulation of this. Um, there's a specific way to do IRAC in my view. Um, you will see, you can even check, check the web, check YouTube. There are all these free materials that will talk about IRAC. Not many sources will tell you what this means. I think this is way too general a framework to be easily usable, right? Um, it's like being told how to interview, you know, smile and be nice and say interesting things. What are the interesting things? What does it mean to be nice? Weirdly, uh, it seems obvious what those things are, and yet it's, it's not super obvious. Okay. IRAC is a formulation of the issue. It's a summary of a fact hook plus a name of a claim you will analyze. So this is often super hard for students. Uh, and it's, it's how you describe a legal problem. Um, and you, you, don't, you can just write a title. It's, it's, instead of an entire sentence, it's easy and just as good. Uh, so to me, this is how you describe an issue. Um, very few analyses of IRAC tell you what the issue is. Uh, and I think it's, it's one of the hardest things to formulate. This is easier. This is easier. But weirdly, the thing that appears first in IRAC is one of the hardest things to do. So basically, this is just a flag to tell the professor what it is that you're talking about. What you need is the parties involved, so perhaps the defendant, um, the action, maybe the fact hook. Charlie Bound punches Lucy after, you know, she takes football away. Um, battery, you know, does this constitute battery is maybe the way to kind of formulate this. The rule involves restating the black letter, the elements of the black letter law exactly as the professor wants. Set out all the professors, uh, all the elements or factors and use numbers to identify each element. You'll see why in a second uh, that these are examples. I don't wanna uh, belabor this. Um, an analysis fits the facts to each element. First in support of the legal claim, then in support of the other side, then coming to conclusion on that element. So on easy elements, you don't need to say a lot. On hard ones, I think there always needs to be an objective two-sided analysis, a he said, she said between the potential plaintiff and the defendant on that claim. A conclusion is a probabilistic prediction. It's, it's, it's just a prediction on who's likely to win based on the black letter law that you're given. Um, and you have to, uh, the, the best conclusions reason it out. X wins because not just X wins. I'm coming back to Tapiat again. Issue analysis is a skill. It's not a piece of knowledge. It's not enough to know the rules uh, within IRAC to be able to perform that. You also have to be accustomed to applying the facts to the law and to making a prediction on, on, uh, on the claim. Okay, that's that. Um, I can say more about IRAC. That's probably the most I can say, and I'm, I'm kind of running past the time that I want to in this webinar. So let's come back to you. Um, I've given you an overview of the psychology of law school, of the differences between college and law school, the three pillars of wisdom, and kind of nitty grittier analysis on how to conduct an issue analysis. So uh, let's try to get, I mean, that a lot of that's conceptual, even though it's nitty gritty, maybe it doesn't mean a lot to you now. In terms of structuring your semester, what do you do? Uh, given what I've, I've told you about the psychology of law school and the things you need to do well in law school, um, how should you structure your semester? This is what a typical law student semester looks like. August to October, 
you read frantically, maybe you brief cases and you're confused and you panic, or maybe you get over your panic and you feel like you know what you're doing because you're reading cases successfully and you're briefing them. Sometime in November, maybe late November, you start, you're told to start outlining, which is to kind of take knowledge. I'm not going to go into it here. I really don't have the time, but um, it, you're constructing your own understanding, your own framework of all of the black letter law of the course. Maybe in late November, December, you, you take practice exams for the first time after eating too much Thanksgiving turkey. Then you hit mid, uh, uh, early or mid uh, to late December, <laughs> all of December uh, exams. To me, this is, this is what everyone is doing. And if you want average results, you follow this semester structure. This is what my student's semester generally looks like. From the beginning, you work consistently on reading, which includes pre-studying or side-studying the law so that you're not over-reading. You read the outlines, and then you read the case itself. You're done. And you don't, uh, frankly, worry too much uh, about uh, the kind of peer pressures that would push you to overread because you will know that they that that kind of following peer pressure won't help you in on your exams you're reading from the beginning you're outlining from the beginning and you're taking some kind of practice exams or hypos from the beginning um, by late November and early December the difference is then by then you're working on past exams for your specific professors. Okay, you save those for last. Um, some professors don't even make their past exams available. If they do, those are gold and you don't want to waste those uh, by trying to work on them first. You want to kind of, again, master the law, master issue spotting by doing lots of getting practice doing issue analysis and getting feedback on that. But you, you work with practice problems that are not necessarily your professors if they don't offer a lot of practice exams. And then the last part, the concrete part, um, is that you will uh, master your professor by focus. You will kind of lock yourself into your professor's mentality um, uh, by working on those practice exams. This is a dumb chart that I drew. Uh, effort and time. You know, others are going to kind of ramp up their effort as, as panic increases. You're going to kind of maintain a steady effort working from the beginning on the right things. And that will get you, um, uh, I think anyone who can guarantee you anything in life is a liar. But my students who followed this diligently have tended to do very well in law school. So weekly, um, you know, what does this mean? Um, you outline every week, I think from the beginning, you pre-study the law and you do fun things. You actually have to try to stay mentally healthy. This is a sprinty marathon. Um, and so you need to do things to kind of maintain your mental health. I said, don't waste your time with, um, extracurricular activities, but I don't regard self-care, exercise, uh, having a social life, maintaining a relationship if you have one, like um, all of that is healthy uh, because your brain does need downtime. Um, you just have to understand physically how your brain works. It needs downtime. It doesn't need to be overstuffed with extracurriculars that you're doing just for the sake of resume. Um, your brain does need to relax. Daily, take a practice exam a day or something close to it, pre-study the law, keep up with the reading um, so that you can understand your professor. Lastly, um, get feedback. Remember that practice, practice is better than nothing, but um, the kind of Malcolm Gladwell stuff on, on the 10,000 hours that people need to become masters and things, you don't even, you're not going to get 10,000 hours to practice doing law school exams. Um, but it's not just 10,000 hours of practice. It was 10,000 hours of deliberate practice of somebody um, giving you feedback or getting feedback somehow um, on the thing that you're practicing. 
I'm Larry Lala and I do run, um, I have some online, um, some resources online. Um, this webinar, I have a website and I have some YouTube videos uh, where you can see more. It's just youtube.com backslash Larry Lala. I did want to talk about something else. Um, you all kind of get this. Um, I really feel like one of the simplest advantages you can exploit in law school is just to start before everyone does. Um, if you can, a lot of people work, um, but I've even had some students who work to manage to get ahead and start early. I think there's a conventional wisdom, and you saw it in maybe the previous slide deck, uh, where the, I think it was the dean of UCLA told students, like, to have a relaxing summer, um, you know, you don't need to do anything else. I think that presumes that preparing ahead doesn't help you. Now, if you go into a lot of the wonderful places on the web like Reddit and Top Law Schools, Top Law Schools is generally a good resource, but the forums are kind of Reddit-ish. You will, you will see a lot of people who hang out there and they're full of negativity and they'll just say preparing ahead doesn't help you. Uh, prepare, you know, you, I just, I did fine. Um, but it's amazing how many people will do this, say this. A lot of law students will say that. A lot of law school administrators will say that. They don't quite have the longitudinal perspective that I do. Um, and I can't have claim to have done like, um, uh, regression analysis. But in my experience, what I have seen over time, that my absolute best students were ones who started early, even as early as the spring um, or or summer. Even uh, the middle of the summer was fine, but before they got to law school. Um, I totally think that this conventional wisdom is wrong, that preparing ahead does help you. Uh, I'm not talking about like just well, but like straight A students, this, this really um, doesn't happen. Even I wasn't a straight A student. I was close some semesters, but, um, but people who just had amazing, amazing grades. Um, and I won, you know, you have to think about the psychology of people who say preparing ahead doesn't doesn't help you. I think law school administrators are sincere and want to believe this, um, but I think they haven't internalized how broken um, legal education is. Uh, they, they want to make it a nice, friendly, not super stressful place. At least a lot of the fancy law schools like UCLA want to. Um, but I don't know if that's the reality. A lot of law students will say that. Maybe incoming law students don't want other people preparing ahead. Um, or uh, some people might want to rationalize that there wasn't anything they could have done before law school. Um, before, let me, before, uh, I almost was one of these people who, who didn't prepare ahead of law school. Um, I I went home, I grew up in, um, in Reno, and I was about to head off on like a three-week vacation with friends before I started law school. And uh, a friend pulled me over. He forced me to go to drinks with him. And I said, and he'd gone to Harvard Law School and I was headed off to NYU. And he said, you really need to come with me. And I said, I, I'm, I'm totally I'm fine. He's like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. You come with me, you have some drinks and I'll tell you how to kind of uh, uh, do well in law school. He is now a, a law professor himself. Um, and some of these principles I learned kind of tutoring, uh, uh, but, uh, but the thing that he told me was, it's not true. I mean, the thing that he saved me from was kind of, I could have easily fallen into the trap of just doing what everyone else did. I, I'm a more passive person than I want to be. I just want to get along. And so I think I, I would have thought I was doing the right thing by reading cases frantically. But it took a friend uh, 
And I can't even remember if he paid for the drinks or I did, but he made me come with him. And he said, you have to prepare in advance. And the number one thing he said to do was pre-study. Number two, and if this dates me a bit, he told me to go to a file cabinet in the law library when I arrived and to look at the final exams. So the two current, the core things that he gave me was to pre-prepare, uh, to, to kind of pre-study the law, to understand the black letter law before reading because the case book was just going to be confusing. A case book is not a textbook. Um, and the intuition that I had to understand the end game before, be, before I even started this semester, to actually see what a final exam looked like for a given class and to kind of internalize what it would mean, what... Um, to view everything through that lens. So part of this is um, wanting to uh, pay forward that, that favor that he's done me. So you have uh, the webinar. I think um, Steve will make it uh, available in other ways. Um, there is another set of things that I've developed, a set of tools that I think can help you do this even more effectively. So my website's called Larry Lala. I have a course called Kick Cools, Kick the Crap Out of Law School. Um, I wish I, I I'm kind of had this course for a while and now I wish I could have picked a different name, but what can you do? This is, this is what I have. This is what it's known as, Kick Cools. Um, presumably you all have dreams. Um, there's some thing that's driving you to go to law school. I don't know what it is. It's a bunch of things. Um, a, lot of, a lot of students where I went to law school wanted to be human rights lawyers. Uh, classic thing is to have seen To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, uh, for a lot of you, it's to make money for good. I don't know. Maybe some of you just want money. Some of you want it because maybe like me, you're the child of immigrants and you kind of wanted to better your family's prospects. Um, maybe you want to work for the United Nations, or the Federalist Society, uh, you want to be a public defender or work for the department. There, there are a million different things that reasons why you might want to go to law school. Um, you pay a lot for that dream. Um, I, maybe I should get rid of up to, uh, a lot of you are going to finance law school through a massive amount of debt. Um, there's also the opportunity cost of not working. It's three years without being paid, although you may get some pay during your summer jobs. Um, I, you know, I don't want to say it's the worst job, legal job market ever. Basically, there was a huge change about 10 years ago after the financial crisis of 2008. And in many ways, the legal profession is doing well, but hiring has never picked up in the same way. That could be attributed to a lot of things, uh, outsourcing, these broader factors that are impacting employment in the United States that are now reaching the law, artificial intelligence, uh, technology just makes it easier to do more with fewer people. Um, so you're in, the result is that there's heavy competition for the few really good legal jobs um, out there or these kind of dream jobs that people uh, really want to pursue. It's just as competitive as ever if you wanted to work for the Department of Justice or to even get a, a job at Human Rights Watch. Um, to make this dream of a reality, as I said before, you really have to nail your first year. Uh, your future job depends on your 1L grades. You interview the summer of your 2L year as early as August before you even start classes. You're interviewing for uh, your second summer job, but that is what usually becomes your final job. Uh, the jobs are mostly gone uh, by the time you're 2L or 3L because government agencies, nonprofits, and the big law firms, they tend to hire their incoming, entering um, first-year associates or beginning lawyers are almost all hired 
based on their performance as as summers at their their two L summers there. Uh, you don't you you don't have the third year to interview uh, for jobs. So a lot of people propose like why not just make law school two years? Uh, that practical answer is because I guess law schools would make less money that way. Um, but a lot of the jobs are gone. That's just uh, a kind of brutal reality. Uh, your 1L grades depend 100% on your final exam performance. Uh, and again, you know, no other assignments are graded that year. On top of that, your, uh, your, your exam grade is dependent on your ability to issue spot and analyze. So 1L means everything. I, I don't want to overemphasize it. You will probably hear it enough when you get there but you've got to hit the ground running in the right direction. I don't want to never say never, but it's extremely hard. Uh, so such that the generality that you can't recover to L3 L year. Maybe you can recover after bad first semester grades if you really nail it second semester, but it's very hard to recover from a bad first year. You kind of have to get it right immediately um, your professors won't help you to get it right. So, again, coming back to kit cools. Um, what is it that's missing from law school and, honestly, other products? It's kind of a good battle-tested, uh, good battle-tested advice on general law study skills. And to me, this is the, the one thing that's most missing from other resources, really detailed explanation of issue spotting and analysis. Um, I think you'll find the kind of general overview that I provided a lacking from most even paid resources, but to do that for specific exams, um, I think is kind of the key. You really need a system to practice lessons and hypos. Um, now, here's one of the mysteries um, that perhaps you've got, one of the questions you have from my uh, uh, webinar is if the pillars of doing well in law school are master the law, master issue spotting, and master professors in that order, how am I supposed to get better at issue spotting until I've mastered the law? Um, and so a lot of students, this is a big question that a lot of students have um, when they work with me, like if I look up in a practice exam, uh, you know, on the Berkeley website, it won't tell me the law that's applied. Of course, it'll say this is a torts exam, but it won't say like you need these, you know, to know this law to take this exam. Um, so what this does, what, what, what's the problem here? Uh, I think the tragedy is there are students who want to prepare the right way, but then get scared into not taking exams until later because they want to uh, they don't feel like they know the law. They want to then finish their outlines and then they end up taking exams. Maybe they're still a, somewhat ahead of other students. But they haven't, practically speaking, practiced taking exams before other students because they were waiting until they felt like they knew enough law. Ultimately, that puts you in the same boat as everyone else. The key thing there is to get up that learning curve faster than other students. So Kit Cools uh, solves this problem. Um, I offer more detail, even more than I've provided in kind of text and video lessons on key study skills and the right approach to law school. You can kind of go back to those resources again and again if, if you missed something. Um, and um, Kit Cools refines a lot of the things that I said and goes into even more detail. Um, I offer tricks that honestly no one else teaches. I base that on having talked to other students and having looked at you know, what's available out there. Um, but I, I think Kit Cools offers the, the deepest advice that there is on issue spotting and analysis of any product out there. That's my opinion. You can take that with a grain of salt. You can compare it to other things, but I'm not aware of other products that kind of go into the depth that I do. Um, on issue spotting and analysis, um, or tries to break down this set of key skills more than anyone else. 
Um, it's more than just IRAC. Um, I offer kind of subject specific advice as well. There are certain patterns, uh, certain ways of approaching particular subjects such as contracts that a contracts exam is not the same as a torts exam. You can be very good at issue spotting. The next level is to understand how a contracts exam is, is different from a torts exam and to master the intricacies of a contracts exam. Um, the other thing is I try to stage it. I offer, I start by offering bite-sized hypos and ramp up the difficulty so that you can kind of get better and better. Uh, so you can start with simpler problems, start where you are and you can build to harder runs until you're capable of taking full exams. Um, and one of the key holes that I feel is a lot of my hypos, I give you the law to apply at least on the earliest lessons so that you can begin to exercise uh, the issue spotting muscle without having mastered all of the law. Uh, for instance, with torts, you don't have to know all of torts. You can start out with a battery hypo because I'll just give you the battery law to be applied um, or some of the key points of negligence law that you need to use um, to do a negligence problem. And eventually you'll be able to issue, you, you eventually have to get to the point where you don't have the law given to you um, this way you can kind of master the law and master issue spotting in parallel. Um, why does that matter? Um, you can mass, kind of build your issue spotting mu muscle faster than everyone else. If you can start at the beginning, um, you get better at issue spotting faster than everyone else. And then you'll end up with better grades because you are better at the key skill than other students are um, at an earlier point. Um, so these are recent uh, student successes from, from last year, but these are kind of unsolicited real emails that I got from students. Um, dear Larry, um, I wanna let you know that I finished my semester of law school with straight A's across the board, an A plus in torts. Why didn't you get an A plus in every class? Ha. Huh. Uh, leading my professor to offer me a job over the summer. I know for a fact that the single defining element of why I did so well was your courses. Um, kind of general tips, office hours, explaining concepts, and hypos put me head and shoulders above my classmates when it came to issue spotting. Um, so I really love this email. Uh, of course I do, uh, but I think that this this feedback kind of emphasizes what I've been telling you. It's just from someone else's mouth who's actually lived this. Um, I did a, a poll once. This was somebody's um, 1L grades uh, from Northwestern Law School. Uh, look at the GPA. It's a 3.975. There's a B plus, but there's an A plus that kind of offset that. Um, this is kind of after the fact. This is a 3L who didn't buy my course, but um, and I was offering a webinar. I'm not one of your students. I'm a 3L. However, I came across your service and used your free instruction to dramatically increase my performance to a 3.92 this semester. It's a little late for me to be thinking big law. That's um, the big high paying law firms. But if you find a way to use this testimonial, uh, this for its testimonial values, you're welcome to. It's my humble opinion that no incoming law student should do without the support you provide through kit cools. Even the second semester of law school is too late to find one stride. I don't know if I agree with that. I, I, I think you still can. I have had some students recover from a bad first semester, but it's hard. Um, law school is a game and one who seeks to win must grasp the new maneuvers as, as early as possible. Um, this isn't top of the class, but this I still uh, this still makes me happy. Hope you're having a great weekend. At first, I received my first semester grades back and have a 3.57 GPA, around top 15, 20 percent. I'm uh, kind of blocking something here. Before much better next semester, I wanted to let you know I couldn't have done it without you. Thanks for the course and your effort. Uh, just more stuff like this. Um, I'm blocking this, but people are generally at decent law schools and sending me this. 
without kick calls, I probably would have been lost. I hope to improve my grades this semester, but this person didn't do so shabbily. A minus in torts, crim, legal writing, and, and B plus. In LarryLala.com dot com backslash LSAT unplugged hyphen sales. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself or just drop the question into chat, into the chat, and I can read it and, and open it up. I'll mention that um, uh, the deadline to buy, I don't kind of leave the course open year round at this point. Um, I need to be able to handle new students that I get. The deadline is, is Friday, March 8th. One last thing that I, I can do is do a quick run through of the course. Um, and we'll show you what it looks like. If this is kind of uh, uh, the, the general syllabus of the course, but you have a lot of the strategy. Um, Lesson, sorry, I'm going to collapse this. As well as uh, specific tips and hypos for, um, for the course, and I can expand that. Um, this is kind of what uh, a hypo looks like, one of the early hypos. Um, I give you uh, the law that you're supposed to apply. In this case, it's kind of criminal. And then a fact pattern. Um, occasionally some tips on how to approach a particular question and then the question and then you can kind of type in hi Larry uh, and once you do that there is for most um, at least um, uh, an issue checklist to go through And, um, and links to kind of model answers that you can go through as well. Um, some of the more Some of the hypos have uh, video and I'll add a bit more and have some video analysis as well. Um, where I kind of walk through and, and talk uh, um, but you can see like the bits of analysis I had a kind of where I go through a video, this one's a video hypo, uh, and go through a, an analysis of, a, of, a, of an answer, um, as well as an issue checklist. So that's what it looks like on the back end. Kind of stop the sharing and um, leave it at that. Um, Leave it open if anyone has questions. Otherwise, again, to emphasize um, the closing the sales page uh, at the end of this week on, on midnight on Friday. Um, not entirely sure when I'll open it again. I hope you buy the course, but if not, I hope you can use my free advice and uh, really remember the key things uh, to avoid and things to do um, as you go off to law school. So best of luck. I hope to hear from some of you soon. Uh, in any case, thanks so much.